Please join me in welcoming Professor Shirk tonight. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming here tonight to talk with me about China. This is my first visit to University of Delaware. I'm very pleased to be invited. It's an absolutely beautiful campus, uh, especially in the springtime. The trees are beautiful. In California, Southern California, we don't have this same beautiful landscape, and I've really enjoyed spending the afternoon with the students in the class that is associated with this lecture. It's been great having the opportunity to talk with them personally and hear about their plans. We had dinner together, um, and I'm really impressed uh, with the talent here and the interest in international affairs. So the subtitle of my talk tonight uh, is, Can China Rise Peacefully? Of course, the history of rising powers is not a happy one. Uh, history tells us that, uh, as a rule, that rising powers almost always lead to war. Not so much, necessarily, because they behave aggressively. <coughs> Excuse me. What a place to pause. <laughs> Not necessarily because of their aggressive behavior, but because people in the present day dominant powers may misunderstand the rising powers <coughs> and read their intentions in an inaccurate way. So, I don't know, I've got a scratch there. <coughs> Delaware allergies. Mm. I don't know why. <laughs> so, um, last week I was in Tokyo with U.S. Senators and members of the House of Representative on an Aspen Congressional Seminar, and we had discussions about U.S.-Asia policy all week. And one of the senators asked me a question after I'd given one of my presentations, said, what is the, what misperception about China do, among Americans, do you most worry about? And I had to improvise an answer. I thought it was actually quite a interesting question. And what I said was, a perception on the part of Americans that, first of all, that China is so powerful already um, and that it inevitably represents a threat to us because China has a, an explicit, well-developed strategic game plan for surplanting the United States, first in Asia and then in the rest of the world. And what I said was that I thought that the future of China was much more uncertain and that it was very much driven by Chinese domestic politics, which are very difficult to predict, and that U.S. foreign policy, as well as the foreign policy of other countries, can play a role in helping shape that future. So that uh, the way we used to talk about it when I served in government, in the State Department, is China's future is a work in progress. It all depends on how things work out inside China. So uh, when I came back from the State Department, I wrote this book called China, Fragile Superpower. Right now, 
I'm updating and revising the book because since I published it five years ago, there have been some uh, striking new developments in Chinese foreign policy that I felt I didn't understand, so that's why I'm uh, revising and updating the book. But let me just uh, explain the title a little bit. When I was writing this book called China Fragile Superpower, I wanted to tell some of my Chinese friends and colleagues about it so they wouldn't be blindsided, you know, because it sounds, you know, pretty critical. Uh, but first I told American friends about it. And the interesting thing is that when I said to American friends, I'm gonna write a book about China, about how its domestic politics shapes its foreign policy, and I'm gonna call it China Fragile Superpower, they all said, hmm, fragile, that's interesting. What do you mean fragile? But when I told Chinese friends about the title, every single one of them said, hmm, superpower. <laughs> and not one of them questioned the premise that China was internally fragile. So you know, to us outside of China, it just looks like such a, already a superpower. If you look at surveys, on which country has the most powerful economy in the world, um, more than half of Americans actually think that China has a more powerful economy in the, than the United States, which of course is a complete mistake because even in scale of the economy, it's still the second largest. And in per capita income, it's like maybe less than a third of what we have in the United States. So behind the headlines that we read every day about China's dramatic economic success, its economic buildup, its growing role in the world on every continent, in fact is a political leadership that is extremely nervous and insecure. It's constantly worrying about that it may be reaching the end of its reign, that the Communist Party cannot remain in power in such a dynamic and open market economy. I mean, nothing like this has ever occurred in human history, and it's actually pretty impressive for how long the Chinese Communist Party has managed to stay in power. But they are lying awake at night worrying about this. And this is not just my projection. In their speeches, they often discuss the uh, possibility of the loss of power of the Chinese Communist Party in China. It's also a system in which the leadership is hyper-responsive to nationalist public opinion. So it's insecure, and it's watching very closely to uh, the nationalist mood in the public. Because Chinese leaders know that the two previous dynasties, I like to call them dynasties, uh, but the Qing dynasty, which was really a dynasty, and the Republic of China, and those two governments before uh, the communists took over in 1949, both of them were overthrown by nationwide mass movements in which the discontents of specific groups, urban groups, rural groups, students, intellectuals, were fused together by this powerful force of anti-foreign nationalism and a critique of the government at the time for being too weak in the face of foreign aggression or foreign pressure. So that's why this uh, Chinese Communist Party leadership 
wants to stay ahead of the curve. They don't want to be viewed by the public as too weak in the face of foreign aggression, foreign pressure. And the main focal point of that nationalist public opinion, you might think it's the US. You know, knee-jerk, Cold War thinking, US, wrong. The main focus is Japan. Uh, the country that occupied China in the 1930s and 40s during World War II in a very brutal way, that memory has been revived. I don't like to say the memory has remained strong because, of course, in fact, anti-Japanese nationalism has gone up and down. Some of it is very genuine and spontaneous, and some of it has been engineered by the Chinese Communist Party to maintain, uh, to stimulate nationalist sentiment and rally around the flag of the uh, People's Republic. So um, Chinese leadership both stokes anti-foreign nationalism and is afraid of it, both. And then the third factor is that the Chinese policy process, which I think from the outside, we think that they're so decisive and efficient, and they make decisions in a very authoritative way, and then there's no opposition, no debate, no problems. Compared with our democracy that we worry about being so dysfunctional, so many veto gates, so difficult to get things done, and we envy the decisiveness of Chinese policy making. But the fact of the matter is that the Chinese policy process has its own problems. It is a consensus-based decision-making process. Um, the key decisions are made in the Communist Party leadership at the Standing Committee of the Politburo, not in the government. And there are parochial uh, bureaucratic interest groups within the government, within the party, even the military. And uh, they often go their own way in ways that are provocative vis-a-vis -vis China's neighbors or even vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, and some of these interest groups really benefit from a tense threat environment. In particular, the internal security police, the propaganda department in charge of ideology, censorship, etc., and the military itself. Uh, and what we see, or what we've seen up until now, um, at the end I'll make some suggestions about, or some um, speculations about the future, but at least up until now, the government, um, the very top leadership hasn't had the um, ability or the motivation, perhaps, to restrain these parochial interest groups. So they're threatening to hijack foreign policy, especially regional policy, and take it in quite a dangerous position and direction. So these are the three features of the Chinese political system that I worry about. You know, in my view, the biggest risk to us from China is not its economic or military strength. It's that internal fragility that could drive it to make threats that it can't back down from for fear of loss of internal support. And the possibility of overreach driven by the parochial interest groups 
that would benefit from it. Now, um, having said that, I, when I step back uh, to look at the full range of Chinese foreign policy to write my book, Fragile Superpower, I actually was impressed with how effective and restrained and accommodating Chinese policy had been uh, toward its Asian neighbors and toward the United States. And this is uh, before about 2009. So why is that? Uh, China's leadership was, is so focused on domestic threats, much more worried about domestic threats than international threats. And therefore, it wanted to avoid any international confrontations that could disrupt their economic development, which is the way they are raising living standards and um, uh, meeting popular demands and maintaining support for the Chinese Communist Party. So a restrained foreign policy, a reassuring foreign policy toward its neighbors, except Japan, um, was the way to do that. So China has been very active in regional and global multilateral institutions. China negotiated um, an agreement on a code of conduct over the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. China signed a free trade agreement with the Southeast Asian countries and China's growth, its economic growth, uh, made most of its neighbors uh, have China as their largest trading partner and really buoyed their economies as Chinese demand increased. Um, so what was really impressive, I thought, about Chinese foreign policy between, say, the mid-90s and 2009 was that the Chinese policymakers seem to have a very sophisticated sense that its rise would be viewed as threatening by other countries, just inevitably, and that therefore the burden was on them to find ways to reassure other countries that they weren't a threat. That yes, their capabilities may be growing exponentially, but their intentions were friendly, were benign, and they did a very effective job of that. Now there are plenty of cynics in Washington, of course, there's no shortage of cynics in Washington, who said, oh, this is just phony. You know, China's just trying to play Mr. Nice Guy. But once it really has the capabilities, especially the military capabilities, then it will step out of uh, the phone booth as the, uh, as the superhero it hopes to be, or from our perspective, maybe the supervillain. But um, again, you know, it gave us every reason to hope that maybe this uh, power transition is what international relations uh, scholars call it, when you have a rising power coming closer to the same level as the dominant power, that maybe this one would actually turn out okay. Maybe the leaders of China and the United States had the statesmanship, the vision, to manage things and um, uh, bring China into the international system, give it respect, give it a seat at the table, 
um, and enable it to share power with the United States and other major powers like Europe and India and Japan. But um, now, as I said, even before 2009, there was another aspect of Chinese foreign policy also related to its domestic politics, which was not quite so um, restrained. And that's, it was its stance toward Japan, uh, toward Taiwan, and to a certain extent toward the United States. So those three issues are hot button issues in Chinese domestic politics. They're the focal point of Chinese nationalism. I sometimes describe Chinese policy, that aspect, that face of Chinese foreign policy as China's id. You know, that's the more emotional side where the leaders did a lot of rhetorical muscle flexing to try to show uh, other elites and the public that they were strong leaders. But it didn't get so out of control and with the United States presence in the region uh, as a strong ally of Japan and of course a very good friend with also um, a somewhat softer commitment to defend Taiwan uh, that up until 2008, 2009, it looked like things might turn out all right. What happened then is that China's foreign policy, especially toward its regional neighbors and even toward the United States, became more provocative. More, what the word we use is assertive which is not quite aggressive, but still potentially dangerous. And we saw this in issue areas that had not previously been the focal point of Chinese nationalism. So, for example, in the South China Sea, over the territorial disputes, things were pretty quiet for quite a few years. And then China's uh, fishing agency, its oceanographic agency, uh, its Coast Guard, started asserting China's sovereignty claims over this very expansive claim that China has in the South China Sea, and of course, there are quite a number of Southeast Asian countries as well as Taiwan that also have claims in this area. Now this is one reason I felt I had to revise and update the book because this could not be explained with nationalist public opinion. The South China Sea was not the focal point of intense nationalist emotion in China until around 2008, 2009. And what happened then, I think, is that these parochial interest groups started going their own way, pushing the envelope and provoking fights with China's neighbors. Um, and by the way, encouraging the media to follow along with their TV cameras in ways that would help them stoke public opinion and make a case for bigger budgets for their agencies. So, uh, and meanwhile, nobody in the Standing Committee of the Politburo at the top was telling them not to do this. There was not effective restraint because the leadership, uh, the from 2002 to 2012, the number one guy was Hu Jintao, 
and the Prime Minister was Wen Jiabao. And both of them came to be viewed as leaders that, who were pretty weak and indecisive. So they did not exercise effective policy coordination and restraint. And before you knew it, the internet public, which is prone to respond to issues in a nationalist way once it becomes a prominent issue in the media and the internet, these interest groups were stirring up fights that became issues, and before you know it, it had become um, a hot button issue. Another what I would call policy mistake on China's part was related to Korea. Now, China's policy of keeping a peaceful Asian neighborhood and avoiding fights that could be uh, domestically damaging. One of the linchpins of that policy was China's uh, improving relationship with South Korea. So of course, South Korea is a very good ally of the United States, um, but and China has this long-time legacy alliance with North Korea. But North Korea was becoming increasingly viewed as a burden by Beijing, and relationship with South Korea offered tremendous um, economic potential. China is now South Korea's largest trading partner just as China is Japan's largest trading partner. Um, and also, by trying to be friends with South Korea as well as North Korea, China could prevent the region from splitting into two blocks a, you know, in a Cold War manner, a block of friends of the, and allies of the United States and a block of socialist countries, China, North Korea. I mean, China did not want to be left, frankly, standing on the side of North Korea, Cambodia, Russia. The Russians, for years, have tried to cultivate a closer relationship with China and China actually is very cautious because they have felt that they did not want to crawl out on a limb with Russia in a way they, they viewed it as what is the economic, other than importing energy, what is really the benefit of that to us? We want to maintain a decent relationship with the United States and we don't want to get into fights with our neighbors. So this relationship with South Korea was cultivated and became surprisingly close. China wanted to show that it could be friends with everyone. It could be friends with North Korea and South Korea. But then North Korea made two unprovoked attacks on South Korea. Torpedo attack on a South Korean naval vessel and an artillery attack on an island that had not just military forces, but civilians. People were killed. And yet China did not publicly criticize North Korea for those unprovoked attacks and alienated South Korea and the South Korean public. Because, you know, it's fine to want to be friends with both North and South Korea, but when one of your friends makes an unprovoked attack on another of your friends, there's really no way to be neutral. You have to pick your side. And um, so that was, a, and the story of that decision is very interesting. I did a lot of interviews on this. The story is that the foreign ministry, which used to be the dominant bureaucracy for making foreign policy, 
wanted to criticize North Korea and stand with South Korea as the victim of this unprovoked attack. But in the Communist Party uh, central headquarters, they have a department in charge of relations with other communist parties. And this actually is one of these legacy bureaucracies that really doesn't have much uh, utility anymore. But they felt very close to North Korea. They've always felt very close, party to party ties. You know, and the, also the Chinese military feels very close to their North Korean um, allies because they fought together in the Korean War, et cetera, et cetera. So this decision was basically engineered by these groups within the decision-making process within China. It's not one that the public really cared about. As far as I can tell, based on what's on the internet and in interviewing people, there's very little affection between the Chinese public and North Korea. But they ended up standing with North Korea because of these parochial interest groups. So these are the kinds of mistakes that caused a backlash from China's Asian neighbors. And in fact, um, uh, you know, the response of China's Asian neighbors to this more assertive Chinese policy was right out of an international relations textbook. You got what you would call a balancing reaction or a balancing coalition. All these countries started running to the United States saying, please come, let's do joint exercises together. Would you like to send your ships for refueling? Could we give you some place for your military to exercise? They wanted to get closer to the United States because their, um, their confidence in China's friendly intentions was shaken by the way China was behaving. Now, China blames the reaction of its neighbors on the United States. They say that the Obama administration came into office with a determination to intensify its efforts to be engaged in Asia, especially militarily. And that uh, the United States' active diplomacy, its rebalancing, sometimes called the pivot, that's what uh, encouraged these other countries to go after China. And you know, you have to acknowledge that if countries feel more confident that the US is going to remain an important presence in Asia in the long term, that they may feel more willing to challenge China or question China's policies to give a little pushback against China, whereas if they didn't have uh, the United States there, and they felt that they, their security depended entirely on appeasing China, then they probably would be much more docile. So I think there definitely is a connection between US foreign policy and the position that other Asian countries take toward China. But if you just look at the timing of things, it's not uh, the case that the US came in and encouraged all these other countries 
to turn against China or anything like that. So this is China's misperception of US foreign policy. And it's one that has been highlighted in China's official media, which has definitely had a big impact on the thinking of the Chinese public and the Chinese elite. They feel that the US policy is to contain China, to keep China weak, keep China down, and that we've manipulated China's Asian neighbors into standing with us and creating this balancing coalition to contain China. So now just a qu few quick words about Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, China's current leader, appears to have recognized that the policy-making process in China had severe coordination problems. And probably not just Xi, but some of the other top leaders as well. So here's what they've done. First of all, they've shrunk the Standing Committee of the Politburo from nine to seven to make for a more cohesive <coughs> process of deliberation at the top. And keep uh, these parochial interest groups from going off on their own. Well, they also have created a stronger central leadership by creating a two-tier standing committee of the Politburo. This is a long, complicated story, but uh, political succession in authoritarian communist states like China is a very difficult business. How do you figure out who's going to really be at the apex of power without creating splits that could bring the whole system down. So what they did is they created a two-tier standing committee of the Politburo. Xi Jinping, who's party secretary, president, and in charge of the military, he and Li Keqiang, who's the premier who leads the economic um, policy, are the younger leaders who, unless something unpredictable happens, which is always possible, they will be in power for two terms because it's become the norm for Chinese leaders to serve two five-year terms. They'll be there for 10 years. They'll be there, whether we like it or not, until 2022. But the other five leaders are older. They will only serve one term, and then they will bring in five more to kind of rotate, give more people the chance is one way to look at it. And what this means is you've got a two-tier, for the first time, we have a two-tier standing committee, and really this concentrates power in the hands of Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, but especially Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has also created a bunch of leading small groups. Uh, one on the reform agenda, which was rolled out last fall in China, very important economic reform, but not just economic reform, it's supposed to cover a whole broad range of areas. Generally, in the past, you would find the premier in charge of that. But in this case, Xi Jinping has put himself in charge of that group. He also created a new National Security Council, which is as focused on domestic threats as it is on international ones. And he made himself the head of that. There's a special new group 
on internet security, which is a combination of cybersecurity and the content of the internet for uh, censorship to make sure that uh, the internet doesn't become the mechanism to coordinate anti-party collective action. Guess who's in charge of that one? Xi Jinping. So, and then there's a lot more to tell about this uh, massive anti-corruption campaign targeted on the man who formerly was the czar in char charge of internal security and his whole network, Zhou Yun Kang. Zhou Yun Kang reportedly was the only vote to support Bo Xi Lai, who was one of the senior leaders who went public in trying to generate a public following uh, before Xi Jinping was promoted in the 18th Party Congress. Bo Xi Lai, you, you've probably heard his name, his wife was accused of murder. The whole thing was pretty sordid. But Bo Xi Lai was a very ambitious guy. And reportedly, Zhou Yun Kang stood with him. And some people even think that Zhou Yun Kang was plotting with Bo Xi Lai to replace Xi Jinping after two or three years with Bo Xi Lai. Well, so it looks very much like Xi Jinping is using anti-corruption campaign to um, consolidate his own personal power and to wipe out rivals who might challenge him. So, you know, on the one hand, I welcome a stronger leadership in China because of my analysis of the problems in China's political system, at least in part being caused by these parochial interest groups that are going their own way. And I look to stronger leadership to uh, restrain these groups to think about China's national interest and what China's national interests are are to rise peacefully without provoking a confrontation with its neighbors or with the United States. So um, that would be my hope for Xi Jinping. Uh, so far, it's not clear. Uh, there are some worrisome signs about the way China is handling the territorial, maritime territorial disputes with Japan, with Southeast Asian countries um, in the South China Sea. The, we see that Xi Jinping appears to want to maintain a good relationship with the United States. He was the one who liked the idea of having this uh, informal meeting with President Obama at Sunnylands. All that was really good. It looked like Xi Jinping was trying to get the relationship back on a positive track. But uh, I'd say that right now it's too early to say whether these problems in the Chinese political system are getting resolved and whether or not China will be able to rise peacefully. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, that was a very interesting uh, account. Uh, for a minute, I thought that you would be the ideal person to, buy, to, to write the Chinese version of uh, House of Cards with all these you know, <laughs> intrigues and, 
Um, but seriously, on, on, on that issue, in, in your book and today, you, you argue that one of the most important lessons that the Chinese leadership uh, learned from the Tiananmen Square uh, event was that any split in the party could uh, threaten the whole political right. system. And now you are describing a, the, the efforts of the new president to consolidate power, which is one way to prevent, of course, splits. But when you have a change in the status quo, there is always potential for conflict. Sam Bruce might resent these efforts of the current president to accumulate power. So what is your view? Do you think that there is a chance that these efforts to concentrate power uh, might create some resistance from local party leaders or other factions that might see their power being diminished? Yes. I think it's a very risky thing he's doing. Um, and I'd like to quote Chen Yun, who was a very prominent senior leader in the Deng Xiaoping era and before in the Mao era. He, I brought this because I like the quote so much I wanted to get it right. Okay. Fight corruption too little and destroy the country. Fight it too much and destroy the party. <laughs> now, you know, up until now, officials within the party had the expectation that playing ball with the party, being loyal, making a career, that there were certain rewards that would come to you. If you're, and there's a certain distribution of the spoils of power. If you start changing that distribution, so you're stripping it away from some groups and keeping it for yourself, mm -hmm. I don't see why the other leaders will stand for that. Now, you know, um, I can't tell you exactly what would happen, but remember Xi Jinping's own family is vulnerable. Uh, Bloomberg News did, uh, you know, the New York Times and Bloomberg have been doing this amazing reporting on the corruption inside the families of Chinese leaders, and Bloomberg did one on the Xi Jinping family. That's why Bloomberg is not welcome. <laughs> welcome in China anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is very gutsy things that they're doing, these uh, Western news organizations. So in any case, I think, I mean, as a student of Chinese politics, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and just a quick follow up on that, on that question, because we've seen similar, not maybe identical, but similar dynamics in other authoritarian regimes and for the leader to concentrate power, he or she has to rely on a much stronger security apparatus, right? Secret police, there has to be some healing. We're having some feedback here. No, that's me. I... <laughs> and, and do you think that that is a avenue that is open in the, in the current situation in China, that the regime might get more repressive, not only against these local disturbances, but actually inside party members or leaders of factions that might try to push back? I think you're asking all the appropriate questions. Uh, Xi Jinping and the other leaders have demoted the security portfolio from the Standing Committee to just the Politburo. So there's no other security czar in the top collective leadership other than Xi Jinping himself. So he took direct control over the internal policing. So that repressive apparatus is held in his hand, which is right out of the playbook that you're describing. 
Okay, I have another question, but I'll save it because I, I want to give the opportunity to the audience. Yeah, please. Um, first of all, I must say that I'm very, very impressed by your very insightful observations of the current Chinese reality or quote unquote reality. And particularly about your role. Can other people hear him? No, I will stand repeat, up. Will, Why don't you stand yeah. up at least? Yeah. And I will try to, re to summarize briefly your question so it can be. But project, project. Yeah. Okay, I, I have to summarize so we, we have a record of the question. Uh, Yang Wo, for those of you who don't know, he's the director of Confucius Institute, uh, so a very well-known uh, scholar. Uh, so the question is, to what extent this political change that the current president, who I'm not trying to pronounce his name, so I'm just saying the current president. She. She. she uh, uh, it's the result of his own personality, uh, attributes, his charisma, or there is more, a, a deeper change that is occurring in the, in the party? Well, I see it as a reflection, not of charisma, but of the uh, effort on the part of those generals to protect their own skin. And when Right now, everyone in China, because there's been anti-corruption efforts in the military, too, and they're all, everybody's engaged in self-protection. And Biao Taing, you know, taking this stand to show your loyalty to the leader is a way of basically sucking up <laughs> and trying to protect yourself. So I don't think it says anything about his strength as a leader at all. And, you know, if he's smart, he won't trust in any of that anymore. You know, what, what he'll care about is what's going on behind the scenes. I might want to mention that Xi Jinping was, you know, many people believe he was chosen 
because his father was a leading Communist Party leader and the so-called princelings, and that he was actually the, of that cohort, the youngest one who could serve for 10 years. You know, because these age limits are somewhat constraining for the promotion process. So many people think that there's no special talent that Xi Jinping has, but people thought a princeling was, a, people in the Communist Party thought a princeling was a good leader to have because he would be um, heavily invested in the survival of the Communist Party, highly protective of the party because everything, his own fate, mm -hmm. his family's fate depends on it. Right. So therefore, go for a princeling, get one of the right age who's young enough to spend, to serve 10 years, Xi Jinping. So, you know, there are many people who think he has no more outstanding qualities than Hu and Jiang Zemin, but he definitely has moved to create the institutional arrangements that will enable him to rule as a strong leader. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Please. Mm. So what are the possibilities of a counter-revolution? Cultural, Cultural revolution. Cultural revolution, okay, in China. Yeah. What a so great revolved. question. Yeah, yeah. We were joking about that earlier, right? That what China probably needs is a real communist party. <laughs> well, you see, those of us who are interested in Chinese domestic politics are obsessed by it. We can't <laughs> stop talking about it, right? And the stakes are very high for those of us in America, too. Just a quick comment on your first remark about China, U.S. viewing China as a threat uh, if it has more wealth. You know, our two economies are so interdependent. Uh, I think our leaders and China's leaders understand, even if the public may not really understand this so well, because it's very complicated to understand how could China own so much of our debt and have this big trade surplus with us. We've got a trade deficit with China. This helps us keep interest rates down, helps stimulate our growth. Uh, helps keep prices down, which is good for the consumer. You know, the whole thing is so complicated, but Americans are, of course, kind of uneasy about China owning a lot of our government debt. So, but the point I want to make is that I don't see this as some zero-sum contest for economic supremacy. Who's bigger? This is not the playground. 
you know, this is a complex, interdependent global economy, and everybody can win. And you can have healthy economic competition. There's nothing wrong with economic competition. Um, we have economic competition with Japan, with our European allies. There's nothing wrong with that. On your question about the Cultural Revolution and Boshi Lai, so for those of you who are not following Chinese politics on a day-to-day -day basis, um, Boshi Lai uh, revived Mao's slogans, a lot of Mao era culture, and um, he made a lot of speeches and public policy trying to attack problems of income inequality. So there are many people in Chongqing where he was party secretary, in Dalian where he was party secretary before that, and throughout the country who think that um, he was kind of reviving the true faith of socialism against this system that's become corrupt, unequal, and they blame the market economy for that rather than political privilege of uh, the party. So people call them ultra leftists mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they get out and demonstrate from time to time. Like when they had anti-Japanese protests back in uh, September of 2012, a lot of the people who came out to demonstrate at the Japanese embassy were carrying Mao um, pictures and they were basically supporters of Bo Xi Lai. So I don't think the, pro I don't think that has huge appeal in China. I think there are too many middle class people whose values are very different, who uh, you know, don't want to go back to the bad old days. So it's an interesting question, but I'm not too worried about another cultural revolution in China. Um, Although in the long term, it is one theoretical possibility. As, as income inequality grows and, right. you know. Mm -hmm. We have a question there? Hmm. No, only one. Where do you see the future of Chinese soft power in Africa? That's that's a good question. Um, where the future of China's soft power in Africa? China has become a a widespread presence in Africa, um, initially motivated by the need to get um, minerals and energy resources. Uh, and in order to uh, get those investments, cultivating relationships with the politicians in those areas but one of the ways that they've done that is by massive investments in infrastructure. So African countries will be better able to trade with one another, travel, everything, because of the infrastructure that China's helped build in Africa. Now there's a backlash in Africa. A lot of people are calling it neo-colonialism and they don't like the fact that they bring Chinese workers in to do all the jobs and don't hire local labor. So it's a, um, and the government can change, you know, you can cultivate a good relationship with one group of politicians in an African country and then it can change. And, you know, it looks like China's um, starting to appreciate some of the advantages of good governance in Africa, just like other foreign investors. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it develops in the future. As to soft power, 
I think there's a certain amount of respect and appreciation for the infrastructure construction. But in terms of values and uh, soft power more broadly, Chinese government has worked very hard around the world, not just in Africa, to increase its soft power. And it's been a struggle. Um, I think they've had a hard time figuring out what China really stands for. You know, reviving Confucianism, I think Confucianism has a lot of appeal. People have a lot of respect for it. But it doesn't seem, um, it seems kind of artificial because Confucianism was basically attacked in China for more than 30 years. And trying to revive Confucianism nowadays in China is not that easy. Uh, Communism and socialism itself doesn't have that much appeal to people. Um, and it's really China's economic success. That's the basis of the respect that people have. But I personally feel that the Chinese government's efforts to increase its soft power have kind of backfired because it looks so clearly engineered by the government. And what really builds soft power for a country is the society and the system, not the kind of external propaganda of the government. Right, because there is a difference between soft power and just propaganda, right? People know the difference. Yeah, yeah. sir, yes, you. Mm -hmm. Hmm. in Canada, in the United States, in Britain, in Europe. Uh, and I've talked, uh, I've, I've worked with some in tutoring and things, and I'm uh, wondering if there's been any studies, or is it too early to study, if, are any of these students, as they return to China, uh, having an in, impact in uh, some of the, the values in, in one, of the, one of the problems or in a pragmatic approach to Chinese-American Chinese relations is the United States has some very strong religious, moral leaders that, uh, that really do drive many of the the, uh, much of the attention of the American people. When they see a, what is perceived to be a repressive regime, repressing two of their major ethnic minorities, two, uh, many of their uh, uh, intellectuals and dissidents, that creates a, uh, yeah, the, the rule of law is, is a huge challenge there. And especially even for American businesses trying to go there and figure out, you know, what is the law and how arbitrary is it? And if, and if you offend the wrong person, they find the law that you've broken. So uh, an optimist like me <laughs> or a person with values, you know, of American, uh, Western values, hope that many of these students will return to China and with a little bit different emphasis on things like the rule of law, the, the, the right to assemble, the right to disagree, the right to express yourself. Okay, so basically the, the question is what is the possible or actual impact of students who go abroad to study and then come back? No? Well, I don't know of uh, any research on their attitudes and values and how they may differ from other students. There probably has been research on this. I'm just not familiar with it, so I don't. So we might see some yeah. st studies in the future. Let's have two more quick questions because we're getting close. Yes, lady. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so why don't we take the last question and then maybe we can try to join it together. So this question is about what are the, what, is there room for more growth and what will happen if growth ends? In the economy. Ends? Yes, yes, you. I did not catch the... <laughs> What's the power behind Xi Jinping? Okay, so we end with those two questions. <laughs> well, first of all, let me say, um, you pr you're probably thinking of some retired leader or something like that, right? But I, um, you know, f China's retired leaders have continued to play some role in politics, but it's kind of murky. It's hard to know for sure. And, you know, Jiang Zemin, who is the retired leader who seems to have been the most active in retirement, is really pretty old now. But China's leaders live a long time. <laughs> I call this the ginseng factor in Chinese politics. <laughs> the ginseng factor. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's hard to know, really, if there's some other leader who's important in helping support Xi Jinping. I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't think, I actually don't believe there is anyone that, or that it's that significant. On the economy, uh, China is now facing slowing growth uh, because it's inevitable that China's growth, you cannot sustain double digit growth rates for another decade in China because the, of demographic factors primarily because the working age population is shrinking as a share of the total population. It's been 70%, which is unbelievably good. The dependency ratio is increasing, smaller families, one-child families, the aging, the problems that Japan and Korea face from an aging population, China will face too, unless it allows immigration. Imagine that. <laughs> um, so growth rates will inevitably slow. But then what happens to all this highly leveraged economy? And that's the anxiety of global investors, it's the anxiety of Chinese domestic investors and of the leadership. So they introduced a third wave of market reform back at the third plenum um, of the 18th Party Congress in, um, in the fall. And we're all watching to see whether or not these reforms will be implemented. One of the, or a lot of the reforms are aimed at uh, creating a domestic capital market, which China doesn't really have yet. Why do we have the real estate bubble? Because families have no other way to invest their savings. Interest rates, bank interest rates are so low. So people just, you know, ordinary families, I'm sure your family, your family own multiple real estate investments. Every kid's got an apartment, you know, the parents, grandparents have an apartment, you know, because that's where you put your savings. So they have this big real estate bubble. I think they can bring the air out of that bubble. They have the mechanism to do that. Um, but they also have all these um, shadow banking problems because, again, people created investment vehicles to try to get higher interest rates. They're not backed up. They're not guaranteed at all by the government, but people are investing in them as if they are guaranteed. 
So right now there is quite a lot of risk in the Chinese economy and um, if they introduce some of these market reforms too quickly, it actually might be bad because on the one hand, we'd like to see them happen. We'd like the Chinese economy to become more market oriented than it is today. But if they do it too quickly, all of this leverage, all of this debt might really cause an economic crisis. So they have to fine tune the implementation of those policies very carefully. Thank you very much. It's almost nine o'clock. And so before I, I finish, let me remind you that the last event of our Global Agenda series is next Wednesday, same time. We will have uh, Michael Reed, who is the uh, writer at large for Latin America for The Economist. So uh, I you know, invite you to come uh, back again. And uh, thank you, Susan, for a wonderful uh, presentation thank and you. great Q&A.